Hello, everybody, and welcome to Madden Benz Unfiltered with Mark Madden and me, Tim Benz, brought to us by our new sponsors, as you see at the top of the screen, the Barber School of Pittsburgh, locations on Banksville Road and in Monroeville. Day and night classes available and rolling now at bsp.edu. Barber School, yes, Google the Barber School of Pittsburgh. Dot edu also brought to us by Alter Genius Brewing. Uh, try their brilliantly crafted brews and enjoy their full kitchen at their brewery in Ambridge, or try their trailside tap room on the Montour Trail in Imperial. It's great. I've been there. Treat yourself at Alter Genius Brewing Company and tell them that you were sent by Matt and Ben's Unfiltered. Get yourself a small pour on the house. Mark, let's pick up where we left off from the podcast yesterday because you and I didn't have a chance at that point to talk about the Stanley Cup final, uh, which was not yet set at the time. It is now Florida and Edmonton. What do you think? Does Connor McDavid get over the hump against the Panthers? I think that's a really long flight. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the northernmost team against the southernmost team in the NHL. That's the first time that's happened. Um, I think Connor McDavid – is on a roll. He he seems to have shaken off whatever injury he's had. Uh, at least last night, he scored that great goal going through traffic. Uh, the great Michael Farber, the all-time hockey writer from Montreal, he uh, just tweeted that goal would normally lead people to say that Connor McDavid could stick handle it, except there's no more phone booths. Uh, <laughs> that, that was just a spectacular goal. I can't believe Edmonton won a playoff game where they only got 10 shots. That's just incredible. But that Skinner kid in goal finally came through. He is lately for Edmonton. But I got to make Florida the favorite. I think Florida will just take a super physical toll on Edmonton like they did the New York Rangers. I think that's where the Eastern Conference final was won. Uh, Florida just literally beat New York down. And without being dirty, just physical. Well, Mark, that leads to an interesting conversation about McDavid because I tend to agree with you. If I'm picking, I'm picking Florida. I just think they're the better overall team and more playoff finals suited if such a thing exists. But, you know, is he good enough that he doesn't have to win one to be one of the all-timers? Like, does he fall into that Dan Marino, <laughs> Carl Malone category where you don't need no, to win? No, no, nobody does. Carl Malone didn't either. Carl Malone's not an all-time great in the category. Uh, guys like Jordan and uh, and uh, the guys who won a lot of championships. He's not. LeBron, et cetera. you got to win at least one to validate your individual work statistically, et cetera, regular season. you got to. McDavid has to, too. So you would feel the same way about Ovechkin if he put up every other stat except winning one cup? Yeah, it's lucky for him he won that cup, or that's all people would be talking about as his – career winds down. They'd be contrasting him chasing the goal record, career goals uh, chasing Gretzky, but never having won a cup. Yeah, I get that. I do that. I'm guilty of doing that as well. But I know I'm a hypocrite about it because I don't do it for Marino. If anyone's an exception, it's Marino. I think he's one of the best quarterbacks of all time. So yeah, uh, if there's an exception to every rule, it is Dan Marino to this one. I think Florida, like I said before, wins. As far as the entertainment value goes, I think it's almost strictly about McDavid and Dreisaitl versus the Panthers. Like, you know, Kachuk's a great all-around player. I mean, he's a good playoff player. but He's just not a star-capturing kind of guy in his own, though, from a Florida point of view. Oh, none of, none of them Florida guys are. They're a team team. They're a big team. They're a heavy team. Um. What's weird about that series, here's Edmonton's one disclaimer where they could win, okay? Edmonton has that great power play, obviously, which has picked it up after a brief slump. Mm -hmm. Florida's the most penalized team in the playoffs. There you go. Well, speaking of Florida and kind of going to the penalty box, I found it interesting. I wrote that column about Brian Rust and what he had to say about how if the Penguins had gotten into the playoffs, they would have beaten the Rangers, which I think is silly to say, period. But I got an interesting email from somebody who said what bothered them more is how disdainful Rust was in speaking about the Panthers and how telling that was about how the Penguins still want to try to do it their way. Forget about the disconnect from reality that Rust showed in regards to, oh, we would have beaten the Rangers if we gotten in there. 
the comment about the Panthers stood out to this person more, and I, I guess I can see where they're coming from on that. The Penguins have a distorted view of what they are. They have had for five years, maybe more now. So what and I've done it for five it? years, maybe more now. What what can they do about it? Lose. Mm -hmm. Not make the playoffs. Just wallow in their own BS. Believe me, this team is doomed for the balance of, of having this group. Okay? And, you know, they did what they did. It's nostalgia. It sells. They 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 don't want to change for, for Sid's sake more than anybody, but they can't win with this group. Uh, Kyle Dubas, I think, is a brilliant general manager. He's being held hostage by the core three and the coach because they're just going to do what they're going to do. Mark, one other quick hockey note before we move on to other things. It was We're sort of belated on this, but over the weekend, the anniversary of the 92 Stanley Cup sweep of the Blackhawks was completed on June 1st. Uh, what do you remember most about that series, in particular that last game where the Penguins won 6-5 to five against Chicago with six different, I think all six were Hall of Fame goal scorers? I think that's right. Oh, no, Kevin, uh, five of the six were Hall of Fame goal scorers. What I remember most, actually, is game one. Uh, the comeback, Lemieux's goal at the death to win it. That was just incredible. I remember the Blackhawks tried to shut it down in game three, lost 1-0. Opened it up in game four, lost 6-5. No matter what they tried, it didn't work. And don't forget the Blackhawks had an 11-game win streak going into the final. And then the Penguins finished off the final with their own 11-game win streak. And I consider that to be even more so than the Penguins having won uh, what was it, the end of the 93 season, Tim, 19 in a row? 17, yeah, I think it was 17. 11 straight wins to end the Stanley Cup playoff is the most impressive winning streak ever. Yeah, and beating, you're right, game one. It's it's rare you talk about a championship series and say that game one was the most memorable game, but it certainly was in that series. And, well, and I remember Rick Tockett said, when they didn't win that game, they just weren't going to beat us. They had to win that game to, to get momentum and confidence, and and they lost. I, I, I'm, I don't know if the talk said this, but I'll say it. They lost in the worst way possible. It would have been better to lose 6 nothing than to blow that lead for the Blackhawks. So you had that memorable game, and then certainly the 6-5 result, how it happened, 3-3 three to three after the first period. Dirk Graham has three goals in the first period alone for the Chicago Blackhawks. But the two games in between, Barrasso was great. He only gave up two goals over the course of the two games. Uh, Barrasso probably should have got the Conn Smythe and not Mario. Mario got it because of brand name and because he played very well. But let's not forget, he missed, you know, a big chunk in the middle after Graves broke his hand. Right. But anytime Barrasso gets slighted, I'm good with that. <laughs> All right, Mark, let's move on to the Pirates and what they did in Toronto or what they didn't do, like hits with runners in scoring position, aside from future all-star Rowdy Telez, of course, who is clearly – back on it and showing everything that he was meant to be for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was three for three with runners in scoring position yesterday. They lost to the Blue Jays because everybody else was a combined 0 for 13. They were 1 for 15 in that 14-inning game on Friday, and I believe they went the last eight innings without any hits. Yeah, I mean, they showed just enough promise where you wonder where they'd be if they added a little bit. But, but at the end of the day, it's the same old failures in the same old ways, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I wrote about that today because the two big things that cropped up were their inability to get base hits with runners in scoring position. I think they're 29th out of 30 teams in Major League Baseball right now. And then on top of that, there was the bullpen usage again. And it's just a constant over-reliance on the pen, Mark. It's just too many times. Well, yeah, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave the starters in longer? I would have left Quinn Priester in to try to get one more out. I would have left Bailey Falter. They're just not going to. They're just not going to. And, and, I've, and I've been saying that the Pirates, given the strength of their starting pitching, should be the team that lets the guy throw 120 pitches once in a while. But or they the won't. Case of, or in the case of the Priester, 97. Walker, the agents will get involved. They just won't. Every manager in baseball manages by rote anyway. I can't fault Shelton for doing what all the others are doing. Yeah, I, I look at their bullpen, and I see Holderman is usually good. Certainly, Bednar and Chapman haven't been as consistent as they wanted, and they have nothing to get there if they've got to get the starter out. And they keep going to it over and over again, and it's really hard to get four mediocre pitchers 
on their game on the same day when you're pulling a guy like Bailey Falter, who's been really good for you after seven, or in this case, after six. I agree, but the way baseball is managed today, you can't get away from that. By the way, did you know Trevor Bauer's 5-0 and with a 1.50 ERA in the Mexican League? I didn't see that. Um, I haven't been keeping track of the Mexican League. It's a struggle enough to stay in touch with the Pirates, but he should be here. He should be somewhere, and why not here? Although, Marcus, it would just be more of the same, though, because here he'd be their fourth or fifth starter because the other four are good. Yeah, but he'd be minimum wage, Tim. And you know what? You wanted him to go a few extra pitches well, and throw okay. That that'll give you then. Then in that situation, they would definitely use him up, and they wouldn't bother going to the bullpen. And if he was pitching and pitching well, they wouldn't give into the temptation of having to go to the pen to save his arm or anything like that, because they wouldn't have to right. pay him anything. Right, not for a year anyway. So yeah, I, I I really think they missed the boat with that. I think every team in the league missed the boat with that. Yeah, and it's also you know how the bullpen is constructed. Like they went righty righty to go to Vogelback when they took Priester out in the first place. They just don't have the flexibility. The way the team is constructed, I mean, if you're not going to spend significantly on other teams' free agents or tradable options, at least give the manager as many options as possible with the minimal talent that he has coming out of the bullpen. And they don't even do that. By the way, I imagine Trevor Bauer in Mexico kind of like Brendan Fraser in the movie The Scout. <laughs> have you seen that? What about Kenny Powers? No, no, no. More like Brendan Fraser. Uh, I love Albert Brooks. I, I think everything he does is A, hilarious, and B, has a subtlety to it that, that is tremendous. And there's a scene when Brendan Fraser is playing in the Mexican League where he hit the home run over the 708-foot side. And I go, wow, that is just – that's a little drop in. You just can't get away from That's awesome. Uh, Mark, let's talk about the Steelers and their quest for a wide receiver, which in one way, shape, or form, I think just got harder about four minutes before we got on the air today. Did you see Justin Jefferson signed a massive contract to stay with the Minnesota Vikings? I think it was something like, yeah, there it is at the bottom of the screen, $140 million over four years. That doesn't mean anything for the Steelers in terms like they were going to get Jefferson. It does mean something in terms of what the Iukes of the world are going to ask or – Anybody else that they want? Cortland Sutton, who's going to want a big contract if they were to go out and get him? I think Ayuk would want over $25 million a year for four years, don't you think? Maybe more now based on this contract. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Sutton's in that realm, but still, it's just the market. Well, I don't think up. they're going to get either of them anyway. I think they're going to start the season with what they have. Or Juju. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I, I don't know what... like. Like, I can see, feel it. Whenever I, we talk about this, Mark, I can feel it in your soul. You want the fans to wrap their arms around this the same way that they did when he was still a Steeler and kind of combat with you about how great he is. But I think even the fans have let this one go on who Juju is anymore. No, Tim, I, I just want to lie down for a couple hours. That's, <laughs> that's all I want. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's a – you see, my big thing about the Steelers is there is such optimism about them. And I think it's such an incredibly flawed team, given the way the league is. They got a gap at wide receiver. They got a gap at cornerback. It's a passing league, but somehow all the dill holes out there have conned themselves into thinking that Arthur Smith Oppenheimer is going to be this ground game genius, and they can be that 70s team. And that just isn't going to happen. I think there's something worth talking about there, and we did a little bit when Smith first got hired, and it's definitely worth investigating now as we get closer to the season. And that is, you know, for as much as we want to embrace that notion of football kind of going back in the other direction, they're only doing that because they have to. It's not like they've got Derrick Henry to lean into. It's their only option right now. Is to Which is what Arthur Smith had in Tennessee. Right, yeah, and he had, but he had an option too in A.J. Brown that they used and used and used, and then they didn't have anybody else to throw to, so that's why the offense was still limited to a degree there, even though it put up some decent numbers of Ryan Tannehill at quarterback. Now they're limited at quarterback, and they don't have a receiver besides George Pickens, and God forbid he gets hurt, then what are we talking about? God forbid he implodes like a pinata because he's getting triple coverage all the time too. Like I said, this is just a terribly flawed team, but we might not notice it for a while. 
Because one thing you can do with that 70s team is beat the teams you should. Not that that worked last year against uh, New England and Arizona, but you get my drift. Like, you can pound the ball on the ground, play good defense against teams you should beat, against inferior teams, and you will win. It's when you get to the second half of the season that it's going to be a problem. I want to hear from Steelers fans, Penguins fans, Pirates fans, and all these points of conversation. Like, like, I, get, like I just went on Twitter, and one of the usual suspects in the media was saying, you know, about Ayuk, right? Time for the con artist to work his magic. And by the way, never is a nickname served in any PR better than the con artist. Because <laughs> I think he's had a mediocre offseason. I do. I just don't think he's fixed his team like people think he has. Well, I mean, to, to amplify that, it's not time for the con artist to get the wide receiver. The time for the con artist to get the wide receiver was at the draft. I mean, we're, we just saw evidence as to why it's harder to get him now because it's got to be a trade and sign, and the sign part just got a hell of a lot more difficult. Well, and especially when you're looking at a situation where they might start Dan Moore anyway. Okay, they really might start Dan Moore anyway. Well, I said that on your show last week. You sounded surprised when I said it, but I'd still think they might do that. Yeah, I think they might do it too. Uh, and and if they do that, then there was no point in taking uh, Fatanu. They right. should have taken a receiver instead. Right, because for as great of a tackle class as this was, it was nice to get Fatanu. I think he's a good player and will help them, and it means they don't have to keep Dan Moore. Or there would have been a Fatanu next year. It would have been no sure. problem. Yeah, there would have there would have been a first round worthy tackle that they could have gotten wherever they drafted in the first round. Or if they start Dan Moore, and don't forget Tim. That's that's a, a double duke there because not only is Dan Moore a crappy left tackle, Broderick Jones was drafted to play left tackle, and he still won't be. If they start Dan Moore at left tackle, it is absolute coaching malpractice, dipped in ego with a side order. Of we know better. And here's the thing, Mark. They're making the guy that they traded up to get last year, the swing guy. Like, Broderick Jones is now his own swing tackle if something goes wrong. Right, they are accommodating the least of the three talents because he can't play right tackle. And doesn't want to. Right. And and, and uh, wants Tomlin, When do people understand Tom was a crap coach? When do they get that? I don't know. They never will probably. Well, I think it's in large part because the national media always backs everything that Tomlin says, and it allows the Steelers to have comfort in, oh, the local media just picks on him and is impatient. Well, like Tony Dunsey calling the Steelers a Super Bowl contender. Please, give me a break. No, I, I, yeah, that was just – I know he and Tomlin are tight. They like each other, and that just felt like – and he likes the Steelers. That just felt Tony like – Tony Dunsey's an ass. Yeah. Well, if you know you look what? At him, if you look at him in his life very carefully – he is a Bible-thumping hypocrite. He's an ass. Well, I mean, it takes a lot for me to side with Rodney Harrison on much of anything. <laughs> His indignant response to what Dungy said, I was like, well, he's got this one right. <laughs> I know yeah. he's got this one right. Um, what we didn't talk about yet, Mark, and I give you credit for, I was in touch with you before you wrote your column about Josh Gibson and his stats being included. Not just him, all the Negro League players being included in the Major League Baseball stats. Um, I thought you wrote that column exactly the right way, and um, I thought it was just it was well framed. Uh, that I felt one hundred percent behind you in the way that you approached that. Yeah, it, but but it's easy. It's common sense. They shouldn't be counted. Well, common they sense ain't so common anymore. They weren't in MLB when they put up those numbers. That doesn't mean they weren't great players. Uh, Josh Gibson's in the Hall of Fame. Should be the more recognition he gets, the better. They did not play Major League Baseball, period. Well, here's how convoluted it's already gotten, Mark, and I, I don't know how much digging you've done. Like, do you ever go to Baseball Reference to check out stats, like, you know, for anything baseball-related, the Baseball Reference website? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. So I went. I had to do something for the trip on a piece I'm working on. I had to go to 1944, and I clicked on the 1944 season, and they've got the Negro League teams in Major League Baseball's standings like overall wins, like just in a different font. It's like they didn't even play in the league. Like you can't put them in the standings. That's even one step further than what we're talking about with where the hits are and where the home runs are. Like that's, that's next, Tim. They'll, they'll anoint the Pittsburgh Crawfords like 1944 world champions or something. Well, I know that um, in – I can't remember which site it was. There's another baseball stats site They've that 44 season that I think that they were like 46-24-2 – 
the Homestead Grays were. They've got them listed as champions with the St. Louis Cardinals. You know, it's not like it, there is a and, boundary. And they, like I said in the column, they've ruined their own record book. And not just based on this. They did it with the steroid thing, not letting those guys in the Hall of Fame. You know, and, it, and now we pull guys when they have a no-hitter. Baseball's just screwy. Well, you know what it's also done, Mark? And, and this is why I'm surprised this has been so widely embraced, particularly by those who, you know, are advancing the cause of the stats being included. It's power-washing history. It's like, okay, if we allow the stats to be on the internet in 2024, that means it's okay that Josh Gibson wasn't allowed to play baseball in 1944. No, it doesn't. Like it's it's we have gone so far the other direction we're kind of erasing the wrong that history made in the first place and trying to pretend that it didn't happen by including these stats like to me that's more damning than anything. It's beyond dumb. It's just there's some stuff that I just shake my head at, and this is one of them. Another thing is Caitlin Clark. Oh, I was just about to bring that up. I said how long it would go for them that they mangled it, and they have mangled it. All right, let's get to some conversation, Mark, about uh, what we brought up already. Get to some comments. Sean says, I didn't well, one think— last, One last Caitlin Clark thing. Yeah. Again, I repeat, they needed to put her on a good team in a big market. They didn't need to be fair. They needed to, they needed to maximize what good they could get from their golden ticket. Now she's on a bad team, absorbing everything bad that goes with it. Yeah, do you think, though, if she goes to New York, this treatment like the harsh fouls and everybody being mad at her because she's overhyped would be even worse because the hype would be more? Well, she'd still get the, the harsh foul, but she'd be on a good team. And, and, like, I'll give you an example. People were saying how the fever didn't rush to her defense after that hard foul by that uh, Kennedy girl. Well, they don't need to go out and get an enforcer. They need to be a better team. That's what bad teams do, Tim. Bad teams don't rally around each other. They don't see the points. A two and nine teams are going to rush and protect their top player because they just don't care. Let's get to Sean who says, I didn't think Edmonton would beat Dallas. I'm afraid this is the closest McDavid will ever get. And then he points out what you point out, Mark. We got it. Edmonton versus Florida in the final, which is not great for TV ratings, but honestly. I mean, I don't know what Dallas does to drive up TV ratings either. The best option would have been New York versus McDavid, I think. No, no question. And uh, and uh, I think Edmonton can win this series. I just think Florida will probably beat them down. I think if Edmonton played Florida in a first-round series, which is impossible because of the format, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. but before the physicality took its toll on everybody, I think Edmonton could beat Florida. And by the way, Tim, this is five straight years – for the Stanley Cup final in the state of Florida, where they really love hockey. <laughs> Ron says Florida in five. Uh, I'm going to say six, but um, I, I feel that way too. I think it'll be six, yeah. This comes from uh, Larry, who says, Juju signing with the Steelers would be like manna from heaven when it comes to hilarity. He also says Oppenheimer is a dolt, a total idiot, um, that's why they are zigging while the rest of the NFL is zagging. I wouldn't quite say that because I think the zagging is what everybody does now. Everybody does open, throw it around all over the place. I do think there's a counter element to going all run all the time. It's just limited in what you can do. The counter element can only work if you have better than what they've got. You need a Derrick Henry in his prime type of guy. And it shouldn't be forgotten, Tim, that they got Oppenheimer not because of what he brings to the table, but because he brings to the table what they wanted in the first place. That's how they want to play. So they want to get the guy who plays like that. Uh, one more from him. He says, signs of a decaying franchise, coaching positions and decisions like putting more in as the swing tackle. Well, I wish he was just the swing tackle. And then you have Fautan who play on the right side and Broderick Jones playing the left side. But you can't have a guy who swings who can't play one of the two positions. Like, Mark, Fautan who told me on Thursday of last week, like his big concern right now is making his left leg stronger so he can push off his left leg. Like that just sounds like you're putting so much in the head of your first round pick and rookie by making this position switch. I mean, I guess that part would have been the same anyway, because you have Jones on the left side, but if it's that hard for him, well, Jones can play the right side. Then you can have foul town who play the left. If it's that difficult, I can tell him how to make his right hand stronger. <laughs> Uh, Richard says, per MLB's own rules, 
on awards and statistics. Many of the Negro League players, including Gibson, don't qualify simply because of not enough at bats. Well, if they don't care about what league they actually played in, they're sure as hell not going to care about the minimal number of at bats. Josh Gibson's the all time single season hitting leader, the all time career hitting leader, period. That's what he is. Well, I mean, kind of to his point and what I mentioned before about power washing. I'm just glad Tim, it gives Sean Gibson, his great grandson, gives them something to do. Well, the <clears throat> one stat that everybody knew funny this is strange enough about the whole conversation is uh, people like me who heard about josh gibson read about josh gibson watched documentaries about josh gibson we were always told he had 800 home runs like that was always the estimate he had somewhere between 800 and a thousand home runs that's what it says on his hall of fame plaque well now he's got 166 and like i haven't seen that written about once aside from when you put it in your column i've said it a couple times but it's like well, you're going to change the Hall of Fame plaque now? Well, there's, there's certain things we're not supposed to say, okay? We're supposed to glorify at the expense of fact. I'll give another case in point, Tim. You know what nobody wants to say about Caitlin Clark? The big reason that she is the controversial figure in that league is because she's straight and white and came in and the league let her take over, made her the focal point of the league. That's why the players resent it, period. That's why. Nobody wants to say it, but that is why. Well, you brought it up, too, on the podcast. Do you think uh, – I think you phrased it carefully, but it's not her that's whining. It's some that are doing it on her behalf that's making it worse. No, no. I think she's handled everything in exemplary right. fashion. I no, do. But the other people are doing it. It's sort of like Michael Jordan had to go through this crap with the Pistons and the Knicks and the Celtics, too. No, when he, he didn't. Was, what, when he was fouled all the time? Like Rick Mahorn taking his head off? Yeah, but, but but there wasn't league-wide resentment toward him. He was just the hotshot rookie. This goes deeper than that. I think some uh, of what the Pistons did to him was resenting the anointment sort of thing. That might be more specific with them. And it's definitely more about the on-the-court stuff. I agree with you that the Caitlin Clark stuff extends beyond the court to social media, sociological, all that stuff. But right. I think Jordan had to go through this crap when he was in the Eastern Conference back when he was a rookie. Yeah, maybe. I mean, then again, he came. That team got pretty good pretty, pretty quick, too. Yeah, when they made the coaching change, for sure. That definitely helped and took and it. That's the one thing people don't want to see, is that if she won a better team, it would be a lot better for her. Because like I said, bad teams don't rally around the star player after a flagrant flop. They, want, they think, what's the difference? One more from Richard. Russ comments, just further proof that the Pens as a whole see themselves as they once were, not what they are now. One would think that two straight disappointing non-playoff years would bring them back to reality, but it didn't. I was kind of hoping they'd snap to reality after 2019 when they lost to the Islanders, personally. Was that? No, the Canadians was the... Uh, was the, was uh, the lockout. Not, sorry, not the lockout. COVID. The bubble. 2019 was the big turnover by uh, Jari to Bailey, right? I can't remember which one it was. I thought the 20 was 2019 the sweep. Wasn't 2019 the sweep against yeah, the Yeah, that's Islanders? right. The they lost later on. The, I, it's then, not been a good team for quite some time. Yeah, and because Jari came in in the end of game four of the sweep for Murray, and then it was the COVID year, and then it was the turnover against the Islanders, right, et cetera, right. et cetera. And it's just not gotten any better than that. All right, Mark, uh, I went to Gibson's on Thursday. Two thumbs up again. Your favorite place in the world for steak, and I agree with you. It was fantastic. Best. What did you get? I got a filet. I also got the fries, sautéed mushrooms, and we did everything we could. We <coughs> stayed away from the giant piece of carrot cake, although we were tempted significantly. Oh, you got to get the giant piece of carrot cake and then take it with you. That thing is the size of the size. Do they actually cut it? To make it look like the Sears Tower, because that's the. Way I don't know. I don't know, but it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> See, I always get the Chicago cut, which is their version of the ribeye. Okay. Oh yeah, that looked good. That was tempting too. Yeah. But um, it's one of the places I go that offers prime rib that I don't get it. I've never had the Gibson's prime rib, even though that's my favorite cut of meat. Uh, so thanks again to our new sponsors, the Barber School of Pittsburgh and Alter Genius Brewing Company. Go to Alter Genius either their uh, site in Imperial. Uh, in Montour Trail, that's fantastic. Go there or go to the main brewery in Ambridge and mention Madden Benz Unfiltered or the Madden Monday podcast with Mark and me, Tim Benz, and get yourself a free small pour at Altered Genius. We'll be back with you next Monday here on Madden Benz Unfiltered.